people don't realize that uh, the impacts, the long-term intergenerational impacts, and, and I hope it has stopped with me, but I don't know that for a fact. I still think, you know, there's some things that maybe I do still that reflect uh, how I was raised. But, you know, I think about, and I know many of the people who experienced the horrors of residential school, and I think it's important to know the truth, Canada's truth, that there were electric chairs in some of these schools, that there were all kinds of abuses against children, that young girls, not even the preteens, were um, um, rendered infertile through uh, being told they had appendix operations. And, you know, I know I have a couple of friends who had the, um, you know, were rendered infertile so that they couldn't have kids when they were just children. So, there, you know, there's more, and we, we you know, the discovery of the uh, mass graves and unmarked graves for Indigenous people. So that's Canada's truth. That's part of removing our people from this land, which was rich with all kinds of resources. So we know, as I, I say here, and this is a quote from our report, is that the effects of colonialism have been devastating to the social and physical health of our communities and one of its most nefarious objectives, though, was the deliberate exclusion of Indigenous people from sharing in the wealth of this country. Uh, and it, there are lots of documentation to back up the statement. And I really think that as we go through this week, it's important then for you to learn the truth and for you to look at some of the reading materials to see exactly what happened, to really understand Canada's truth. So when we, as Indigenous uh, people working in the field of economic development, uh, we, we've, we've all known each other for a long time, but we've all worked in our different silos, whether it's a different uh, economic sector or a different um, um, organization that's focused on finance or tourism or forestry. We all seem to work in silos and we didn't work together. But for this project, we did. And we said that uh, we want to be able to pen um, a strategy that would tell people or answer the question that we often get is, what do you want anyway? <laughs> what are you looking for? People ask that all the time, even still today and probably during this discussion. What are you really looking for? Really what we want is socioeconomic parity for Indigenous people in Canada. So the National Indigenous Economic Strategy is a blueprint to achieve meaningful engagement and inclusion of Indigenous peoples in this country. And I wanna just speak very quickly as to why this matters. And this is all written in the National Indigenous Economic Strategy for Canada, which I carry with me everywhere I go. This is a really important document. I've probably read it about a hundred times already as we were developing it. But this is important and this matters for Indigenous people because it's an opportunity, first of all, I should say, to transform Canada in a positive way. You know, some of the reasons for Indigenous people are we can be the drivers of our own success in the Canadian economy by following this strategy or using it for our own strategic plans. We can actually be the drivers because I often tell everyone I work with, let's not rely on anyone outside to help us do what we need to do. There's so much we could do ourselves. Let's make this all happen. Let's do what we can do. And that's been a philosophy I've had, and I think it's been ingrained uh, by my mother as well in me to, you have to be uh, dependent on yourself to make things happen. And I think as Indigenous people, we can do that. For all, why it matters to all Canadians is that when Indigenous communities prosper, so do the regions around them. There's all kinds of economic leakage studies that show how much we contribute to those regions around us. If you look at a community that, an indigenous community that's prosperous, 
I, I think of uh, many fr uh, First Nations across Canada like member two. One of the things that a colleague of mine on the board, the national board, and I would do is always talk to taxi drivers when you're in that area. So what do you think about the Indigenous people here? And when we'd go to that area, the taxi drivers really liked member two. They felt that they were contributing to the economy and, and they understood that. They're the first ones to see that. They're the first ones to see all the activity going to the community for all the conferences that they hold, for uh, the rink there, for all the facilities, the health facilities there. So that when a community like that is prospering, the region around it does, and it just breeds more success. So for all Canadians, you'll see when the uh, Indigenous communities are economically strong, they'll be hiring all the people, doesn't matter who they are in the region, they, you know, I think that's really important to understand that we contribute so much when we uh, grow, when we have a more uh, expendable income. I think that's really important for all Canadians to understand. For governments, it's, this matters because Canada's GDP could grow by about $32 billion a year. I think that's really important. That would, the GDP would grow that much per year if we had the same education, employment, and income levels.